Section 1. You will hear a conversation between a police officer and a woman who witnessed an accident. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 10. You will see that there is an example that has been done for you. On this occasion only, the conversation relating to this will be played first. Hello, madam. I understand you witnessed the accident. Have you got a few minutes to tell me what you saw? Yes, no problem. I don't have to be back at work for a while, so I'm pleased to help. Did you actually see what's happened? Yes. I was standing over there, near the bus stop. I was on my way to get something for lunch and just happened to be looking at a shop across the road. That's when I saw the red car come out from the junction over there. The woman was getting something to eat for lunch. So the answer is, for lunch. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 10. Hello, madam. I understand you witnessed the accident. Have you got a few minutes to tell me what you saw? Yes, no problem. I don't have to be back at work for a while, so I'm pleased to help. Did you actually see what's happened? Yes. I was standing over there, near the bus stop. I was on my way to get something for lunch, and just happened to be looking at a shop across the road. That's when I saw the red car come out from the junction over there. You don't happen to know what time it occurred, do you? Well, I left work for my lunch break at one, and it's only about ten minutes walk away, the office, I mean. So it might have been about ten past one. Although I did pop into the shop for something, so it was probably closer to one fifteen. So it pulled out of Monk's Road, that's the road over there, straight on to High Street. That's right, yes. Did you get a view of who was in the car? There were three of them. Two in the front, the driver of course, someone in the passenger seat and there was someone in the back. They were quite young. I doubt if they were much older than 20. Anyway, they came speeding out of the side road over there and hit that lady's bicycle. The driver didn't bother to stop to find out if she was OK. He just drove off along the main road towards the town centre. Uh, is the woman OK? She should be fine. She banged her head when she came off the bike, so we've called for an ambulance. They always like to check you out in case you have concussion. But no, she seems fine. The bike doesn't look too good, though. I don't think she'll be using that again. I suppose she was very lucky, really. If they'd hit her instead of the front wheel, she could have been seriously injured. It looked like they were just in a hurry and didn't want to stop at the junction. I know the traffic lights aren't working there, so perhaps they thought they could just pull out. Could you give me a description of the car? Do you know the make and model? Well, I'm not very good with cars, but I'm pretty sure it was the same model as my husband's car, a Ford Fiesta. It was red, like I said, and quite old, and the door on the driver's side was damaged. It looked like it had been in another accident some time ago. I don't suppose you had a chance to take down the registration number, did you? I did, actually. Let me see. Um, Y48BYW. Will that help you trace them? That's really helpful. It depends. It might be a stolen car but at least we'll be able to trace the owner. If it wasn't stolen, then yes, we'll be able to find out the name of the driver. Now, would you mind giving me your contact details, just in case we need to get in touch about anything? Of course. What's your name? Mrs Stansfield. Rita Stansfield. That's S-T-A-N-S-F-I-E-L-D.
And your address, Mrs Stansfield? 19 Althorpe Road, Bradford. That's A-L-T-H-O-R-P-E. Have you got a telephone number we can get you on? Yes, it's 0232 566 And do you have a mobile number? Yes, 07834 889 772. That's great, Mrs Stansfield. As I said, we may get in touch if we need any further information, but probably what you've told me is enough. Thanks for your time. No problem. I'm glad to have been of help. That is the end of section one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section two. Section two. You're going to hear a presentation about the student union given during university orientation week. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 15. Now listen to the first part of the conversation and answer questions 11 to 15. So, the student union here is really the heart of campus life. There are many different services and most of the student groups and organizations meet at this facility. As a student at the university, you have full access to all that we offer. I guess I will talk about the dining facilities first. We have eight venues from which students can choose to have their meals. Two of these are franchise outlets that offer normal fast food fare, such as fish and chips, hamburgers, and soda. One dining area has a do-it-yourself system. Specializing in food for the vegetarian and vegan members of the campus community, there is a wide selection of vegetables, fruits, and grains. At the end of the buffet are several cooking stations available for students to create their own meals. The Student Union has a wide variety of entertainment options as well. Those over the minimum age can drink at one of the three bars. During the school year, they regularly offer live music, musical groups from both the local scene and occasionally even very famous people have performed there. All the bars serve domestic and imported beers, wine and hard liquor. A cinema theater with 750 seats is available for screening films. The Movie Appreciation Group also screens many types of films, even foreign and classic movies. Also, the theater is where guest speakers hold lectures. These speakers are sometimes professors from other universities or other notable people. Before you hear the rest of the presentation, you have some time to look at questions 16 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 16 to 20. Now I want to explain how to go about reserving a space in the student union for your event. We have several different types of rooms, ranging from small gathering areas to large lecture halls. Students can also show a movie or documentary at the cinema theater. Any student organization that wants to hold an event or meeting must submit a form available at the information desk in the main hall. On this form, you must provide a name, their contact information, a short description of the event, the type of room required, and the time and date you need it. Any organization sponsoring the event or meeting must also be listed, along with the budget. 
This budget has to include items bought for the event and any people who are hired. There is also a section for any sort of multimedia resources you need. Write down anything you might need, such as speakers, projectors, screens, microphones, podiums, or even computers. We will contact the Media Resources Center to make sure all the necessary equipment is there at the right time. We are always looking for ways to improve the student union. If there is any part of the building that needs service, please inform the person at the information desk. There is also a suggestion box at the desk where you can fill out a card and give us more ideas for improvements. We have about 1,500 people working here for the community, and we're open to anything that can make your university life more enjoyable and productive. That is the end of Section 2. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Section 3. You will hear two students called Katie and Harry discussing a project they are both working on. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 26 on page 6. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 26. Hi, Harry. Katie, hi. Look, let's sit down and work out what we've got to do for this next project we've got for the geography course. I'm glad we're doing it together. We should be able to split it between us so it's not too much work. <laughs> yes, Harry. I had quite a long chat about it with Dr Smith yesterday, so I've got quite a good idea of how we should be organising it. Now, he said we've got to move on from the general project we did on soil erosion and look specifically at coastal change. I think that'll be interesting, don't you? Yeah. I was thinking about it last night because we'll have to make sure we pick our days to visit the beaches. It seems as a reasonable train service to White Sands Bay, but the weather could stop us from getting all the samples we need. It could take us longer than we think. Mm, yeah, but we could save ourselves some time if we try to get hold of any information that's already been collected. I know several postgraduates who have done stuff in White Sands Bay this year, though on other topics. We could check out what the Marine Biology Unit have got. They're bound to have something we could use. OK. Let's do that this week and arrange to go to the beach next week. I think we'll need about three days. If we book ahead, we can probably stay in the University Lodge when we're down there. The other thing is we must go to the Environment Agency and get permission to take the samples, just in case anyone challenges us when we're down there. I think we'll have to fill out a form or something. Right, Harry. Now, let's work out who's going to do what first, because we have to get it done by the end of this month. I think we ought to divide up the data collection between us. What? So only one of us goes to the beach, do you mean? No. I think we both ought to get a picture of what's involved, but there's no need for us both to do everything. I mean, when we're at the beach, you could go to both ends and make sure we have the set of shots we need to illustrate where erosion has taken place. OK, fine. And I'll move up the beach and pick up the different stones and put sand in bags. Does that seem fair to you? Yeah, OK. Then what about the other stuff? Do you want me to go and do the questionnaires while you're on the beach? We'll get more people that way. Or is it 
better if we do them together.、Mm, I think that would be better. We could set aside a whole day for it. What about the lab work, looking at what we've collected and testing it?、Mm, I don't mind doing it, but I'm pretty slow. Okay, you can leave that to me. Fine. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions twenty-seven to thirty on page seven. Now listen and answer questions twenty-seven to thirty. Then that leaves us two weeks to write it up, ready for the presentation to the class on the twenty-ninth. Shall we do the presentation together, like you do the first bit and me the second? Actually, no. I think that can be a bit muddling for the class. I'd like to do the presentation if you don't mind. Fine by me. It's just that it won't affect the marks that you get. I mean, it's not like I get more for actually doing it. The tutor will judge it as a whole, but I think I remember them saying at the beginning of the year that we were expected to do three before the end of the year in order to get a satisfactory mark, and I'm one behind. Whereas you've already done yours, haven't you? I can see why they put them into the course because most interviews for jobs demand you do a presentation nowadays. Yeah. Does that mean I have to write it up? I think it'll be impossible to do that together. Yes, you're very good at that. <laughs> oh yes, typical that I get landed with it as usual. Actually, I don't mind. I know we haven't got very long, but that's okay. Often I write better when I'm pushed for time. It focuses the mind. But I'll have to have a think about how we present the data, because that won't be straightforward like the rest. So I'd like a bit of help with that. Yeah, sure. <laughs> anyway, I was thinking after we've done the presentation, I think it'd be a good idea if we asked our classmates to tell us what they think of our conclusions. Well, I don't know. They won't have done the research, so whatever they say would be uninformed. I don't agree. I mean, they've all worked on something similar, so they know what's involved, and it would be useful to see how they think ours stands up. We'll have to be sure of our ground, make sure we don't make any mistakes in our results or whatever. I don't mean I think they're going to tell us anything new. Just give us their thoughts on the process. Okay, then I'll deal with the questions at the end. Doctor Smith said we would have to prepare thoroughly for this. And I'll probably get lots of background stuff in the process of writing up, so I'll be prepared for any surprises. <laughs> If he's impressed by your presentation, then we should do well. Right. That is the end of section three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. You will hear a lecture about the Inuit Eskimos of Alaska and Canada. First, you have some time to look at questions thirty-one to forty. Now listen and answer questions thirty-one to forty. Good afternoon. In our lecture today, we will continue our study of people who inhabit the northernmost regions of the world. Our focus will be on the native inhabitants of Alaska and Canada, the Inuit Eskimos. 
They have been called the native inhabitants, as the Inuit were the people who had most recently migrated across the gap between Alaska and Siberia. Distinctly Asian in origin, the Inuit, which is literally translated "the people" in their native language, developed their civilization in what is now the Bering Sea region about one thousand years ago. Their culture spread eastward and is called the Thule culture, after the place in northern Greenland where archaeologists first discovered it. The first Europeans to meet Inuit people were Norse settlers in what is now northern Newfoundland, Canada. These settlers lived there for a short time, around 1000 A.D. Approximately 500 years later, beginning in the 1500s, European whalers. Fishing crews and explorers met many Inuit along the coast of Labrador. Russians and other Europeans first met Alaskan Inuit in the 1700s. One hundred years later, in the mid 1800s, whalers began to hunt in the Arctic. Some Inuit were employed by whalers and traded with them during that time. Perhaps one of the most interesting aspects of the Inuit. Is how they were able to survive and grow in such a harsh Arctic environment. Firstly, and not surprisingly, their homes were well adapted to the freezing conditions. They lived in predominantly two types of housing that would keep them warm. In the cold summer, they would live in tents that were made from the skin of the animals they had hunted for food, and they also traveled in boats. These were called umiaks by the natives. In the winter. They would live in houses made of sod, and when on hunting trips, they would commute by dog sled and build temporary houses made from ice. These igloos, which is the Inuit word for house, were uniquely made with a sharp blade carved out of walrus tusk. They would cut large blocks of hard packed snow, about three meters wide, out of the ground. The blocks would then be used to build a six meter dome over a wide, shallow hole. Within one or two hours, an igloo up to ten meters in length could be built. It was weatherproof and large enough to house an entire family. Very early in their history, they managed to develop the technology to hunt the huge bowhead whale, which was the staple food source for them at that time. They also hunted walruses and seals. On land, they hunted polar bears, moose, and various other game. The harsh environment in which they lived meant that a steady supply of food was often difficult to come by. Therefore, the Inuit were a people constantly on the move, looking for food, which meant that their dwellings had to be easily built and easily dismantled. They inhabited the wide open land and, as such, moved freely around it in search of food. Today, the traditional way of life has basically ended for the Inuit. They live in wooden homes rather than in snow houses, sod houses, or tents. They wear modern clothing instead of animal skin garments. Most Inuit speak English and Russian. Some speak Danish, while fewer still continue to hold on to their cultural roots by passing on to the younger generation their native language. The kayak and umiak, their principal means of travel. Have given way to the motorboat, and the snowmobile has replaced the dog team. The combined percentage of the Inuit population in Alaska and Canada stands at 63 percent, the latter being 29 percent, and the former around 34 percent. Some Alaskan Inuit live in towns and cities, but the majority live in small settlements and hunt and fish for most of their food. Most of those in Canada live in towns in housing provided by. That is the end of section four.